uh, Mr. Shabbat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As hardworking families continue to struggle to make ends meet in the face of soaring inflation, now at a staggering 9.1 percent, the highest in 41 years, we're holding yet another hearing designed to divide the American people and distract them from the failed policies of the Biden administration. It's unfortunate that this is how the majority is choosing to use our limited time, but it does present an opportunity to dispel a number of misconceptions that have been disseminated by pro-abortion radicals and their allies in the media. The first and probably most widely spread misconception is that by overturning Roe, the Supreme Court outlawed abortion. This is simply not true. Instead, the Dobbs decision returns the power to regulate abortion to the states, where it always should have been and was prior to Roe. As a matter of public health, safety, and welfare, abortion regulation is properly delegated to the states by the Tenth Amendment. What the question in Dobbs really boils down to is whether you think abortion is better addressed by the people's elected representatives and state legislatures or by nine unelected, unaccountable judges who serve on the court for life. The irony, of course, is that the pro-abortion forces who desperately want nine unelected judges to continue to control abortion decisions are upset by the very decision those nine unelected judges just rendered on abortion. Of course, they only want their preferred nine unelected, unaccountable judges to make these decisions. The second misconception is that Dobbs overturned some sort of sacred legal doctrine enshrined in the history of constitutional law. The truth is that the legal doctrine in question, substantive due process, has a much more checkered and murky past uh, and that abortion advocates would have you believe. In one of its earliest applications, substantive due process was used by Chief Justice Roger Taney, appointed by uh, Democrat Andrew Jackson, by the way, to the court, to uphold the right of slave owners to own slaves in the Dred Scott decision. That reprehensible decision led in many ways to the birth of the Republican Party, the election of Abraham Lincoln, the Emancipation Proclamation. A few decades later, the court used the doctrine to overturn state efforts to implement more stringent labor regulations, arguing that the proposed rules interfered with the fundamental right to contract. When the version of substantive due process threatened to derail the New Deal in the mid-1930s, FDR threatened to pack the Supreme Court, where we heard that before. Not surprisingly, while the court's liberal wing was opposed to substantive due process when it imperiled the New Deal, they were more than happy to utilize the theory when it met their needs, especially in Roe versus Wade. Ultimately, for over 150 years, substantive due process has been employed by liberal and conservative justices alike to find rights and liberties where other legal theories wouldn't adequately support the position that they wanted to adopt. In some ways, substantive due process helps justices fit square pegs into round holes. And that isn't likely to change. Any argument to the contrary is speculative fear-mongering. And that's an issue that ought to be addressed today, the dangerously inflammatory rhetoric that's being employed by pro-abortion radicals. The Democrats have been single-mindedly focused on the rhetoric that led up to tragic events of January 6th, and yet, for the most part, they've been silent when similar language and tactics are used by their supporters. We all know about the attempt on Justice Kavanaugh's life, as well as the harassment that he faced he faced just a week ago. Less widely known are the threats that we've seen aimed at pregnancy care centers across the country, as Mr. Jordan referred to. Now, following the leak of the Supreme Court's draft decision in Dobbs, violent abortion groups have targeted uh, these facilities. And on Tuesday, Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren even demanded that crisis pregnancy centers be shut down all across the country. And over the years, I visited a number of those facilities. They do great work for women and their unborn children, and then when the children are born. Ms. Foster, let me ask you, because I think you're probably the most familiar with these facilities. Could you discuss what actually takes place in, in those facilities and the assault, the attacks that they've been under recently? Absolutely. The pro-life movement stands behind and supports women, um, including with, uh, with a network of 3,000 plus pregnancy resource centers. We support women at any cost with a range of services, including um, pregnancy tests, 
uh, counseling, diapers, material resources like baby formula, um, all kinds of different material resources, um, baby clothing, training, um, relationship counseling, whatever a woman needs, uh, frequently housing even, whatever a woman needs, the center is there to either give her that resource, give her that care and support and counseling. The time of the gentleman has expired.